When we were over at the Athabal Hotel, Ron Coley did a, a talk over there for us, and we had a lot of children over there, a high school, a middle school history class came, and we were really happy to have, you know, someone that, uh, that could share their experiences, especially in a B-52. Uh, when he told me he was the navigator, and I always thought, well, doesn't every plane have a bombardier? No. He's the bombardier and navigator. And, uh, it's really a privilege to introduce Captain Ron Colling, B-52 Navigator. Ron, come on in, buddy. Well, thank you very much. It's great to see such a great crowd here today. I want to thank Emmett for affording me the time to uh, make this little presentation to you. Hopefully it'll be uh, informative to you and uh, we'll go from there. Um, I want to thank all of you folks for taking time out of your busy day to uh, come here and listen to me for an hour. And, uh, and uh, I'd like to ask a question. Are there any personnel that were sloshing through the rice paddies and through the jungle of Vietnam during the Vietnam War, they're here today. Got one. No, I was at Ben Wong. Were you? Yeah. Okay. Not exactly sloshing through the rice paddies like the like the Army guns. I was Air Force. Okay. Okay. Um, so no Marines or Army. I was on the Gulf of the Navy. You were what? Navy. Okay. Navy. Okay. Okay. Um, our mission with a B-52, we, we took it very, very seriously that uh, we wanted to be on time, on target, plus or minus one minute, and aid the infantry troops as much as we possibly could by trying to destroy um, tunnels, the Ho Chi Minh Trail, troop concentrations, ammo dumps, etc. This is the black hole that's uh, referred to in the Air Force lingo as the navigator and radar navigator compartment. The navigator is on the left, the radar navigator is on the right. And I'll be getting into everybody's duties a little bit later on, okay? This was my office for about 2,000 hours out of my life. Um, I do have to do a full disclosure, and for the military troops, I wanted to show these two boxes here. They look like I had to uh, airbrush these out of here. That's really where our mini bar went. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to get these back in. <laughs> Back of the navigator was a jug of coffee and a um, relief tube for the uh, oh. crew members. Okay, <laughs> so I affectionately uh, annotated that and uh, called it our snack bar slash outhouse area. <laughs> B fifty two had. A lot of good things to it. There was one main drawback to a B-52, 
mainly they couldn't control the temperature between the top and the bottom. The uh, pilots were up on the top floor along with the electronic warfare. We were down in the bottom of the belly of the plane, and then we had a, a, a gunner that was in the back uh, in the tail. So it was continuously, the pilots were hot, we were freezing. We were hot, they were freezing. So it was a continual um, adjusting of the temperature, and we never did get it right. It just seemed like it was always kind of like a standoff. Um, I'll go through the crew position just real fast here. The navigator position is on the right. And in back of that, like I said, was the coffee and the urinal. In back of the radar navigator, the guy on the left, there's an entryway that is like a walkway into the bomb bay, which I'll be getting to later on. You go just to the right of the navigator, you go up four stairs. There's a station, that's where the electronic warfare person was. And I'll be getting into all the duties of these people later on. And then about 15 feet ahead of that, that's where the pilots were. Go pilot on the right, pilot on the left. Um, to give you a little bit of background on myself, I uh, grew up in a suburb of Chicago called Naperville. I graduated from college in uh, 1966, and uh, they didn't have room in officer training school for me until January, so I just worked at a job that I had in college for six months. And uh, then I went from OTS from January through March of 67, came out with my second lieutenant bars and thought I was the hit of the world. <laughs> As I got into the, after OTS, I got into uh, uh, the navigation end of things and I was stationed at Maker Air Force Base for NAV school um, at uh, Riverside, or no, no, Sacramento, California. Uh, Castle Air Force Base for B-52 training, Fairchild Air Force Base for survival training, and then my first actual duty station was uh, Ramey Air Force Base down in Puerto Rico. I was there for two years, and then I went to uh, March Air Force Base in Riverside, California. That's where I ended up my career in uh, April of 72. Um, I had 105 combat missions. Uh, from March through July of 1970 and November of 71 through February of 72. <clears throat> now I want to get into a little bit about the uh, B-52, better known uh, in the military as the BUFF, which stands for Big Ugly Fat Felon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I had to clean it up. <laughs> there was uh, 744 B-52s manufactured by Boeing. Uh, we've got 76 flying models right now uh, throughout the country. Uh, they were from model B, C, D, E, F, G, and H. Uh, that in they built 744 models in like 10 years, from 52 to 62. I flew during my tenure uh, mostly C and D models. And uh, now I want to get into a little bit about the pilot, co-pilot. They actually steered the plane. The navigator and the RN, we told the pilots where to go a lot of times. Sometimes they followed our direction, sometimes they didn't. Uh, the navigator basically is in charge of getting to a certain point at a certain time and making sure we stay on course and aiding the RN um, during bomb runs, looking for the targets, that type of thing. The navigator is basically in charge of all the bombing procedures with help from the navigator. Uh, we really worked as a team as far as doing checklists and uh, uh, finding the targets, acquisitioning of targets, and uh, putting the crosshairs on the target and going from there. The electronic warfare uh, fellow upstairs, 
he was in charge of looking for radar sites from SAM sites, AAA sites, um, trying to jam their radar. They're trying to lock on to us and try to uh, acquisition our target as an as a airplane. He's trying to jam their signals so that they can't uh, lock on to us. And uh, he also uh, is in charge of MIGs, that type of thing. Uh, he's basically the guy that keeps us safe. And if we get into real trouble, he will disperse chaff, which is basically aluminum foil, a big bundle of aluminum foil that goes through the air and it screws up the enemy radar so that they can't really tell where we are. And then we have a gunner in the back, a tail gunner that uh, had four 50 caliber machine guns. And uh, he was, we never, he just rode around for 105 flights. He never fired a shot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is me in action. <laughs> and <laughs> I'll, t I'll tell you how this picture was taken. We were the lead aircraft uh, flying out of Guam. The pilot comes down after we level off, and uh, he hit the relief tube. I says, hey, Pete, would you take a picture of me? He says, yeah, no problem. And so he takes this picture. I have developed, this is when you actually took yeah. film to be developed back <laughs> in the old days. And uh, so I showed it to Pete, and this Pete is a, he was the best pilot. He was a great pilot, but he had a great sense of humor, but he always liked to try to tweak your nose a little bit by uh, comments. So I says, Pete, you ever seen this picture before? He says, yeah, I remember that. That's, uh, that's when I came down and uh, you asked me to take your picture. And uh, he says, uh, from what I can remember, you were on the, uh, you were the lead aircraft leading two other planes, and you were on the, uh, uh, calling the other navigators. You are calling the other navigators and I remember you distinctly saying, where the hell are we? <laughs> <laughs> I was just trying to stick it to me. <laughs> um, B-52 is a big, big plane. The length is 159 feet, the width is 185. If you want to put this in proportion, if you put the nose of the B-52 on the goal line of a football field, right in the middle, the gunner would be on the opposing 47-yard line. And if you put the wings out, each wing would be five feet or five yards over the sidelines. That's how big this plane is. The range is uh, roughly about 8,800 miles. That's roughly about a third of the way around the equator. This is yours truly before a mission, and I can tell you exactly when this picture was taken. It was like uh, 32 pounds ago. The ceiling on the newer planes is 50,000 feet. We had a ceiling on our C&D model of about uh, uh, 43,000 feet. Um, we carried 84 bombs in the bomb bay, 500 pounders, and 24 on each wing, either 500 pounders or 250 pounders. This left picture is me uh, removing the, I'm, I'm sure you've seen these like in museums, it says remove before flight. <laughs> we had to accumulate 12 of those under each wing and the radar navigator would come by and recount them to make sure I pulled all of them. 
and uh, and this next one is just a, how the bombs are loaded into the bomb bays. Uh, and I can't say enough about the munitions people and the maintenance people that took care of these planes because we did not have a major malfunction on any of our flights. We had some tweaks before the takeoff maybe or something like that, but nothing major, thank God. So I commend these people to the fullest. They really did a professional job. <clears throat> We would fly in uh, groups of three. There would be a lead plane, and then there would be another plane. Let's just say the lead plane's at 35,000 feet. The second plane would be 500 feet down from that and 500 feet to the right. And then the third plane would be 1,000 feet and 500 feet. So this guy would be at 34,000. This guy would be at 34.5. And then we flew in that formation during the bomb run and put all of our bombs, and if you extrapolate it out, each bomber had 108 bombs, three bombers, 324 bombs, and we would put them in a box one mile by three miles all 324 bombs. So basically it was controlled chaos. <laughs> <laughs> the bombing we used to use was either direct bombing where the radar navigator would put the crosshairs right on the target and the computers would tell us when to release the bombs. And, uh, or we could, if we couldn't find the target direct, we would do offset bombing, which we had the target over here with direct bombing, you put the crosshairs right on the target, go right to it, and drop your bombs. If you uh, used offset bombing, you'd have the target here. We'd put the crosshairs over here, and the computers would still just guide us in and, and drop our load during offset bombing. During 1965 to 1967, um, they kind of let the radar navigators do their own thing and find their own targets. And to be honest with you, the results weren't that great. <laughs> so what they what they did was they institutionalized um, sky spot, combat sky spot, which was a radar um, installation on the ground that would pick us up at uh, the uh, initial point of our bomb run and we had to be at the initial point, the IP, plus or minus one minute at the altitude and the airspeed that we needed to do on the bomb run. And then they would guide us in and then they would count us down and, and tell us when to drop. The accuracy improved tremendously doing that process. And that's the process we, when I was in, that, that's the process we used. Um, We basically bombed the Ho Chi Minh Trail, tunnels, troop concentrations, ammo dumps, uh, bridges. <laughs> it's really funny. We had a, a, we could look down through a periscope and see our bombs hit if it wasn't cloudy. And we would see photographs that we would wipe out a bridge entirely. And the recon photos the next day show they had pontoons across the bridge <laughs> and running trucks across it. <laughs> so, each crater, I've talked to guys on the ground, and each crater of each bomb was 17 feet wide and roughly 17 feet deep. And there was one guy I talked to, he says, he says, hell, he says, those darn Vietnamese, they were using those craters for uh, fish ponds. They were growing their own fish. And said, <laughs> <laughs> now I want to get into Quezon a little bit. We, we, uh, this was again before my time. Uh, Quezon, the siege of Quezon was January through June of 1968. 
and we were literally bombing uh, around the clock. And we were bombing within a thousand yards of friendly troops, which when you're going, you know, roughly 400, 500 miles an hour at 35,000 feet, that's not much room for air. Uh, we did, they did 35 sorties a day for 77 days during that season. Oh, wow. A total of 2,500 just B-52 sorties. <clears throat> The North Vietnamese had roughly 30,000 troops, troops surrounding Khe Sanh, and the North Vietnamese never came out with a final total. Of course, they wanted to keep it secret how many were killed. But, um, it was the, my best, uh, what I could find out, between 12 and 15,000 were killed of the enemy. And we had 6,000 troops. Um, at Khe Sanh, and 220 were killed and 852 were wounded. So the kill ratio there was, was uh, pretty, pretty intense. Um, let me talk about a little bit about our missions. Uh, Guam, we flew out of Guam for two months, Okinawa for two months, and Thailand too much, just south of uh, Bangkok, about 60 miles. Uh, the Guam missions were roughly 16 hours. We'd refuel once over the north part of the Philippines, go in, drop our load, um, come back south, we'd refuel on the southern part of the Philippines, and then come on back to Guam. Um, 16 hours, we were beat, and after a debriefing, and this is one of my fond memories. After debriefing, and I don't care what type of day, what time of day it was, there'd always be this guy selling hot dogs and beer. <laughs> <laughs> and I swear this guy's got a big mansion on Tahiti <laughs> selling hot dogs and beer. Because it was everyone on our crew bought two hot dogs and two beers. <laughs> And we got them down in about 20 minutes and then went to bed. <laughs> um, I'm about ready to show you a video of, uh, of just a B-52 taken off and then a little bit on refueling and then some bomb drops. It's not going to be, you know, four minutes or so. Let me just tell you a little bit about refueling, though, because that's kind of an interesting concept. Um, let's just say that we're over the North Philippines and the tanker is orbiting in a circle, and we're coming up from Guam, and the, as, as uh, in a perfect scenario, the tanker would roll out right in front of us, and we could sneak up, sneak up, sneak up, and the uh, boom operators communicating with the pilot both voice-wise and with lights, green lights, red lights, and when the boom is right where the receptacle is, then the boom inserts the, uh, the uh, gas pump and we're good to go for about 20 minutes or so, 20, 25 minutes, it pumps in gas. Um, the B-52 duties basically was to inch up to that boom operator, this is, and this really takes some real talent on because uh, it's just a little bit, a little bit, and if you go too far, you can, you got to back off. Once you're hooked in, you want to stay hooked in, believe me. <laughs> um, okay, let me show you this video.
Okay, so that gives you a little bit of uh, insight of what we do on a, on a daily mission out of Guam. Um, let me tell you a little bit about the boom operator. He's got a great big glass bubble in the back end of a KC-135, and he's sitting or uh, laying on like a, a small table, padded table, on his stomach, and he's looking out this window at the boom, and he's got, I think, two joysticks that he can uh, adjust the elevation and the side-to-side uh, -side movement of the boom. And uh, like I say, he's communicating with the pilot, uh, both uh, uh, visually with, with uh, lights and then uh, with his voice also. And between the two of them, they communicate and get get them hooked up. Um, okay, that takes uh, Guam, our missions out of Guam, out of Okinawa. We didn't do any refueling. Uh, basically, we uh, just took off. It was like a 10-hour mission. Took off out of Okinawa, dropped our load, and came on back for 10 hours. Uh, Thailand was uh, four to five hours because we did basically um, Thailand. Uh, I mean, no, we did about Thailand. Um, <laughs> South, Vietnam, uh, South Vietnam, uh, maybe a little bit into Laos, but that was about it. Um, the B-52 is scheduled to fly, I just read an article, but it's scheduled to fly through 2050. That's 98 years. That, that's incredible. And right now, you know, we were just dropping iron bombs. They're loading them with smart bombs and nuclear cruise missiles. And I just read this article that uh, they're experimenting with putting two long-range missiles on the wings of a B-52 so that the B-52 wouldn't have to go into Russia and, and uh, drop its load. They could go like maybe over to Europe, fire these missiles, and take care of the same thing without endangering the crew of the B-52. So um, It's interesting. I read an article a couple of weeks ago about in 2013, there's uh, three generations, the grandson, the son, and the grandfather, all flew B-52s. I don't know if that's ever going to be uh, duplicated or not, but that's quite a record. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, some of our missions, uh, some of our missions, um, we, we uh, my first mission over there, or first tour over there, we were going to fly a B-52 from uh, San Francisco over to Guam, and uh, it took uh, six. It's roughly six thousand miles, took fourteen hours, and um, I told the pilot I, I wanted to navigate by celestial, just so I could prove to myself that I could do it when the chips are down. When you're halfway over the Pacific, there's no turning back. And he says, because they got a way of figuring out where they are too so so uh, he says okay try it so I says okay if I get in trouble you just let me know and we'll call it off well I double checked and triple checked all my figures and when we were about 150 miles out of Guam we turned the radar on and I came within 20 miles of, of Guam so that made me <laughs> stars and the sun and the moon don't lie. <laughs> uh, some of our flights, this is basically from what I remember, okay, it's been 50 years, but it seemed like we would fly four flights and we get one day off, and we do 12 flights and we get maybe a couple days off, and just, we just repeat that, that uh, cycle pretty much. It seemed like we were flying like every second or third day at the, at the least, okay. Um, I was lucky enough to give a couple of R&Rs, one to Taipei, one to Hong Kong, and one to Bangkok. Um, one mission we had in Thailand, this was kind of interesting. We were the lead airplane, and there were two in back of us. We get up right before we take the runway, we revved up the engines a little bit, we get an oil leak. So they come out, the maintenance guys come out, patch it up, 
It's okay, you're good to go. Grab them up again, ready to go. Oil leak. So then they say, well, you better taxi back, better get you back, and we'll fix it up there. So then it, we revved it up. It took five times to fix that oil leak. We were totally behind. These other two bombers had already taken off. They were, they were the lead now. So we kind of were tail end Charlie. Uh, I told the pilot to get direct clearance to go to the target and to uh, full, full power to. And uh, we got there minus, we were there a minute late. So it, uh, that's just coordination between the navigators and the pilots. Uh, one mission we had about two in, two in the morning. We were being taken out to our plane and the ground crew says, uh, boy, you guys missed all the action. He says, what, what do you mean? He says, well, about two hours ago, a zapper got through the, got through the lines, and he had a whole satchel of explosives, but they never, they got to him before and killed him, before he could get to, this was like five planes down from where our plane was. Wow. So, um, one mission, we, we landed in Thailand, it was like 11 o'clock at night, and we're just taxiing in, and one of the maintenance guys that followed us uh, says, uh, our call sign, whatever, he says, uh, hey, congratulations, you just ran over a 12-foot cobra. <laughs> 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 I, said, I said, boy, I finally got a souvenir I can take home. Now. <laughs> and one night, we were lucky enough in, in Thailand to uh, get back about 9.30, and we caught the final 45 minutes of uh, Bob Hope's tour, which was very, very enjoyable. Yeah. Um, whenever the navigation team really, what they call, hits the bullseye uh, as far as our bombing, gets all the bombs where they're supposed to be without any flyers, it's what they call you're in the shack club. But we were lucky enough to get it one time, and uh, this is a uh, and they give you a bo each a bottle of uh, Crown Royal. So. Um, ejection seat. Uh, I had one issue with uh, a B-52 ejection system. <laughs> um, after about my third mission, you know, you, you're, you're supposed to wear this uh, survival uh, vest, you know, you got your 45 over here, and I don't know what you had over here. Maybe water wings or something, but it made your arms <laughs> bulge out like that, okay? And I looked down after I wore that vest, and I could see that the edge of the bottom of the plane was like right here. So I thought, well, geez, that can't. And then we had a D-ring that pulled up like this, and that kind of, if you didn't do that right, your arms went out even even more. So, me and my radar navigator, we kind of made, a, made an agreement that we were not going to wear our survival vests unless there was somebody from, that was on our plane that wasn't part of our crew. So I, I went through probably a hundred and missions without my survival vest and that my reasoning was I'd rather go out with both arms and both legs intact than go out without any arms. <laughs> it's kind of hard to survive when you don't have any arms. <laughs> now I don't know if that was true. I never discussed it with anybody. I, I probably should have but I didn't. I just made the decision on my own that uh, if I was going to go out, I'm going out in one piece. Um, December 18th through the 29th, that's what we call Linebacker 2, which was when all the B-52s flew into Hanoi and Hafong for like uh, eight, 11 days, and they really gave them hell the first day. The first wave out of Guam, they, they uh, got off 87 planes in an hour and 43 minutes. It was just one right after another. And they had 42 coming out of Thailand to join them. And 
it uh, was kind of interesting to see the devastation what they what they did because they really did some damage I guess the only problem was and they had I don't want to call it a revolt but they had kind of a serious disagreement between the crews and the mission planners because the mission planners would always have the B-52s coming in from one direction, same altitude, same time of day roughly, and they, you know, the SAM missile sites would just wait and say, oh, okay, well, they're about ready to come, you know, they get the radar, oh yeah, there they are, boom, 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 they send them all up. Um, so the crews really made us think about that. Let's vary the directions that we come in from and the altitudes that we come in from and the time of day that we come in from. And they listened to them and things were a lot better. They still uh, lost 29 planes, 17 to SAMs, and uh, 12 from other, what they said other, I assume that's AAA, I don't know. Um, they flew a total of 729 sorties. We dropped 15,000 tons of bombs in 11 days. And I had a fellow navigator that I went through navigator school that got shot down during one of those missions. But he, I saw him on a video, and he was kind of laughing about it. He says, yeah, we got shot down, but we got rescued okay. It was no big deal. <laughs> but he was kind of a loosey-goosey guy anyway. Now, this is kind of interesting here. There were two B-52 tail gunners that shot down MiGs during this 11-day stretch. Wow. And they have the record as being the only plane, the, the largest planes that have shot down an enemy plane in history. Because the B-52 is the biggest plane. <laughs> There's a lot of argument that one of those was an F-4. Oh, really? Is that right? Okay. <laughs> oh, <my gosh. laughs> but you ought to know, Dave. <laughs> You've been there, done that. <laughs> okay, this is kind of a heartwarming story. And again, I wasn't part of this December of 1972. That was after my time. But after my life as an Air Force uh, SAC navigator and radar navigator. I went into business and, and there was a sales and a sales manager. And uh, I was lucky enough one year to win a trip to Hawaii. And we'd always have a motivational speaker. And this year, it happened to be a guy by the name of Jerry Coffey, who was a Navy pilot. And he was captured and he was in the Hanoi Hilton. And he it was a great speech for about 45 minutes to an hour and he basically told us how they did the tap code and what life was like and you know really interesting information we had a break and then i was seated like in the third row right in front of him because i wanted to ask him a question so he opened it opened it up to questions and i raised my hand and uh he says, yeah, well, what's your question? I says, I identified myself. He says, I'm an ex-B-52 radar navigator, and I'd like to get your reaction to when you first heard the bombs hitting in Hanoi um, during your stint there. And he said, and he had tears in his eyes even after 11 years of, of being released. Because this is like in 1987, something like that. He says, I got down on my knees and I cried like a baby. And I yelled, we're going home. <laughs> and I just thought that was really, because he, instead of having maybe one or two jets dropping three, four, five bombs, you know, they got this boom, 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 boom. He knew exactly what was what was happening. He says they finally came for us. <laughs> okay, a little bit about nuclear alert. Um, 
We spent approximately 40% of our time on nuclear alert, which we uh, had to go everywhere as a crew. So if somebody wanted to go to the BX, we all had to go to the BX and we had to stay as a unit because if they, we had an alert, we had to, we had, had, had to have one guy over here at the gym and one guy over here at the commissary, we had to stay together. Um, because we pulled so much time on alert, at, at the time that I was in, I heard that uh, SAC had the uh, highest divorce rate of any command in the Air Force, which I, I believe, because you're going 40% of the time. Your, your family, your wife, they don't see you. Um, when we were at our home base, we studied war plans, uh, flying procedures. You know, and after about the third time that uh, I studied these war plans, and this was going deep into Russia and that type of thing. I looked over at my radar and I said, this looks like a one-way trip to me. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> uh, okay, um, we spent one to two weeks a month on alert. Uh, we would inspect the planes and the bombs daily. Uh, we did practice alerts, uh, we did training, and crew, and crew had to stay together. Uh, we were on alert basically from Thursday at 8 a.m. through the next Thursday at 8 a.m. and another crew would relieve us. So basically we had Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday off. We would mission plan on Monday, we'd fly on Tuesday, mission plan on Wednesday, and uh, fly on either Thursday or Friday depending on what the schedule is. Um, once a quarter, we would uh, have a bomb run that uh, the navigator would be in charge of uh, programming the uh, air-to-ground missiles that we would potentially have on our wings, and we just do them like a regular bomb run, um, and they would they would uh, score us as far as how close we came to the target. Every mission, we would fly low-level bomb run, high-level bomb run, and uh, that was pretty much it. And every quarter we would do a celestial leg where we shoot the sounder the, and navigate by that. Um, Homestead, um, we were in Puerto Rico at the time and we uh, did satellite alert up in Homestead, Florida. And we lived in trailers, six to a trailer for a week, and then we came back. Uh, one Sunday morning, we were in um, having brunch at the officers' club, and all of us were together. We were coming back to our trailer, and I look out on the right-hand side. I was on the right rear right window. I look out, and it looked exactly like a MiG-15, and happens to be it was a MiG-15 and I guess it had defected from Florida, or I mean from Cuba. And the story that we had, it flew 50 feet above the water all the way to Homestead and then came in and did a landing and none of our fighters were scrambled or anything. <laughs> tell you something if, if you if you want to get into YouTube a little bit uh, Google MITO takeoff and it's a minimum interval interval takeoff for B-52s and I never got into this at all they, they didn't do it a whole lot but every once in a while they did do it it's basically they would take off one right after another. I guess whenever one broke ground, the next one would be taken off. This one breaks ground, this one would be taken off. And the, the air is just black with uh, exhaust. It's pretty interesting to see if you ever want to take a look at it. <coughs> okay. This is uh, some of my stories. And I'll just re be real quick here, because I, I know we're time, locked up for time here. 
we were flying low level one time out of Puerto Rico, uh, and we were flying low level uh, just south of Fort Knox, Kentucky, and it was about 11 o'clock at night, and we really hit some thunder bumpers, and boy, I'll tell you, that's the roughest ride I have ever, ever, ever had. And somebody told me that the wing oscillation on a B-52 can go eight feet up or eight feet down. And I think during that mission, we used a whole 16 and a half feet, we think. But that was the roughest ride I've ever had. And of course, the nav or the uh, gunner is getting whiplash, you know. And all of a sudden, the gunner's saying, pilot, pilot, I got an emergency. Pull up, pull up. And so we got clearance to get out of there. He was getting whipsawed so bad that it split his helmet right in half. He was really in bad shape. I mean, physically he wasn't in bad shape, his helmet was. Um, bomb day checks. After every mission, when we're about an hour, hour and a half out, the navigator's responsibility was to go in back of the radar navigator. There's a door that has a walkway down to the bomb bay. And the proper procedure is that uh, it's in our checklist. The navigator calls up to the pilot, uh, pilot nav, uh, bomb bay check, and then the pilot's supposed to say, okay, bomb bay check. I acknowledge that. Um, there was one time when the communication wasn't wasn't there. The navigator goes back, and part of the pilot's checklist after the navigator comes back from that bomb bay check is to recycle the bomb bay doors in case there's some hanging bombs that are in the in the uh, on the bomb bay doors. And somehow the communication wasn't there, and the navigator was back there and the pilot opened up the bomb bay doors. Not good. Um, and this is this is how punchy you get when you when you fly so darn many missions. There was four or five of us navigators that kind of knew each other pretty well. And we we crossed each other and we one one guy said uh, hey why don't we have a competition on who can do the fastest bomb bay check, you know, and, and this walkway is about maybe that high, and you're bumping against wires, and you're bumping against the bulkhead of a plane, and you've got limited lighting, and you're wearing a helmet at the time, and you're and, and you're going probably yeah, 30 feet, maybe 40 feet, something like that, and no, no, it's longer than that, probably 50 feet. 50 feet up, 50 feet back. And uh, so at one time, I held a record of 28 seconds, but I don't know, I'm sure that after we all dissolved, we didn't really uh, do it in maintenance communication. Um, I'm going to skip Taipei just for the sake of time. Uh, Bangkok, this, this is kind of an interesting story. I had a two-day R&R up to Bangkok, our whole crew did, and we took this clong, what they call the clong, which is basically a canal from a river, and it's probably 30 yards wide, and on each side you got houses with steps going down to the, to the river, and it's filled with vegetable debris, you know, people just throw their, their their husks and all that stuff into the into the river. It, it's really kind of a miniature sewage disposal plant. <laughs> so anyway, we, we're on this boat taking this tour, and uh, I remember I had a camera, but I didn't have the, the forethought to take this. Over here, there's a there's a little kid about five years old that is brushing his teeth. And over here, there's another kid, probably six, seven feet of up river. He's there. He's taking a whiz. <laughs> so, one guy, one guy urinating, and one guy brushing his teeth. <laughs> but that's third world country. 
Uh, <coughs> um, I'm going to skip over Thailand and Okinawa. Uh, we were in Guam. I think this was this was our second tour. Uh, we were in Guam, and I was sitting having breakfast one morning with a couple of guys, and uh, I happened to pick up the paper, and this was in 1971, and the uh, headline was. Japanese soldier comes out of mountains after World War II, or words of that effect. And the Japanese were told, you do not surrender unless you're given the order to surrender. So he was holed up there for 25 years, just waiting for the go okay to come on down. <laughs> and then about four months later, another one came down. And, uh, um, okay, close calls. I'm just going to breeze through this too for the sake of time. Uh, I only had three what I would call close calls in my entire 105 missions. One was a missile that came up and it, it went past us and it missed us by about three or five seconds, I guess. And nobody really had any, the EW didn't have any signals. It uh, must have been maybe on a mobile mobile truck or something. They just raised it and fired it. I don't know what happened. Supposedly, and this is by five seconds. And then one time, this was, this is really weird. I still don't believe this story, but uh, we were the second plane of three. And we were going just into the DMZ, uh, maybe about 50 miles or so, something like that. And this was like 11.30 at night, something like that. And, uh, when you go north of the DMC, everybody's supposed to turn their rotating beacons off so that the enemy can't see the lights flashing. And uh, the lead airplane forgot to do that. And so, again, they said that a MiG came through, fired some shots at the lead airplane, but didn't hit him. And I, I find that hard to believe that a MiG couldn't fire down. Back down to 52, but uh, that's the story that we got. Um, and then my last thing is, is Guam. Uh, one mission out of Guam, and we're taking off about noon. And noon in Guam in July or June is hotter than Hades. And we took off. We're rolling down the runway. We hit, we hit the point of no return, and we kept rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling. I thought, God, when are we going to lift off? We finally just at Guam. Let me preface this: Guam, you take off over a cliff of 600 feet. Okay. So you, you fly over this cliff, and then you got the water right there. Well, we took off. And I'm watching the altimeter go 500, 400. We finally leveled off at about 350. And our being ejection, our ejection seats were bottom ejection seats, so we ejected down. Our minimum bailout altitude is like 250 feet. So, so I'm thinking though, any lucky stars on that. <laughs> um, I'm not going to get into Chrome Dome. I'll open it up to any questions that uh, any of you want to ask. Joe. Yeah. How, how high could the sands go? You know? Because you guys were flying, you said 35,000. 35, I don't know. Dave, do you know? 50,000? It depends on which model. Some of them are up to. Uh, 70 or 80. Oh, oh really? Okay. Uh, so a high alps just didn't eliminate the sands. You know, as a matter of fact, uh, for the buffs, the guys on the ground were launching visually because, of, like Ron says, huh. they're coming down the same time. They yeah. get to the same point and they make a turn. Yeah. When they turn, their raw goes bad. And they were just shooting on a time huh. uh, visually. Yeah. There, there's also the sands, there's a certain and I don't know exactly how high, but there's a, there's a range as they're climbing where they actually can be can be steers, steered, but then they get to a certain altitude where they're no longer steerable, and they're basically just kind of yeah. going on a ballistic uh, trajectory. Uh. 
And so, if depending on your altitude, you're either less or more vulnerable to uh, be, being hit by a sand. Hey, uh, yes, sir. During Vietnam, were there any uh, bases in, in uh, the Philippines for B-52? No, no, no. Just Guam, Okinawa, and Thailand. Yeah, any reason why Clark was used? We had uh, too many airplanes at Clark. That was above my pay grade. Yeah. What <laughs> <laughs> Clark was busy, huh? Yeah. Or uh, Charlie. From a navigational point of view, there must be a lot of difference between navigation then and now from oh, technology. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Could you sort of summarize that at all, 25 words or less? Well, I don't even know how they navigate now. It's got to be GPS, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> but you're still in the same time. That's so funny. He doesn't have as much to do, probably. Um, he drinks the coffee. I Just must be a day and night difference. Well, yeah, I, I would say there's a big, big difference between the way we did it and the way they do it now. Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. got to be. Basically, you still need a radar navigator because you need to find the targets and, and that type of thing. You need a navigator to go from point to point, but right. like I say, it's probably all GPS and satellite and all yeah. that stuff now, I'm sure. All of the, the, in the video, it was all cluster bombing. Is yes. That, that's all B-52s do? That's that? all B-52s, right. Okay. Yeah. Joe? Uh, in refueling in your flights, were most of them daytime? Or was it night time oh, also? They do it any time of day, any time of night. Oh, yeah, yeah it, it, I never could uh, envision refueling at night, but uh, <laughs> it got done. Yeah, it got done. Uh, one, one other follow up. That was 450 caliber in the rear end. Were they radar controlled or manual controlled? I think they were manual, but I wouldn't swear to that. I, I, that's, I never got into the gunnery section. <laughs> I had all I could handle just trying to stare that big plane at where we're supposed to go on time. <laughs> Any other questions? One more. Yes, uh, what was the physical experience of, with different kinds of events, like when you dropped uh, the bombs? Could you feel that? Could you hear, like, when the refueling boom was coming in? Did you oh, yeah. know when things? Yeah, like you can you can hear the refueling boom. Uh, actually, the B fifty two it raised up a little bit when the bombs were dropped because you didn't have all that weight. Mm -hmm. Was it like all like an elevator just whoosh, or you just slowly felt yourself? No, we never. Well, yeah, it was just like a like a slow mm -hmm. descent, and we never felt. The bombs going out or anything. I mean, we there was a light in this video. You see it flashing yeah. on. That was the bomb release light. Yeah. And for every bomb that goes, a light flashes that it's gone. If you got that on, after you drop your bombs, you got a hung bomb in the bomb thing. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Which is what the navigator goes back there after the mission to see if you got any hung bombs. <laughs> One more question. Yeah. Uh, I was in Lincoln Air Force Base, Nebraska. Yeah. And we had B 47s. Uh -huh. And they had bombing competitions back then. Yeah. Have you guys ever in a bombing competition? I never was, no. But I know they do have them. Yeah. Yeah. We just never got into that at our base yeah. for some reason. Our, our, uh, our base crew there at that base won the competition one of the years I was there. Oh, really? And they were going to fly a, a B 47, or maybe a B 52. I can't remember. It must not have been. It must have been a 47 back to the base after doing the bombing competition and the okay. commander of the base was going to fly the airplane <laughs> and they had the band down there and the families and all this stuff and we saw this big bomber leveling off to land making his approach and then we realized he wasn't going to line up with the runway so he flew probably 500 feet over the hangars which i'm sure broke every rule in the book and you could see the crew i mean they were that low you could see the crew in the Pulled that sucker up, came around, and landed. I'll never forget it. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Was it noisy back there? Yeah, it was. It was fairly noisy. Yeah. Yeah. You had to wear your. Uh, we usually used headphones or a helmet, one of the two. That really helped us, especially with radio communications. Yeah. Otherwise, you would never you hear anything. Yeah. Right. Fred. Fred. Did you do two tours? Two tours, yeah. Uh, one in uh, 
70 and then one in 71, 72. Yes, ma'am. Ron, you might tell the story about the Russian trawler. I think that's yeah, really great. Yeah, we won't really have time. Oh. 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 You want me to just uh, leave this here, Mike? Yeah, that'd be awesome. Okay. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> After, when we took off out of Guam, there was always these Russian trawlers, maybe 30 miles out, and they would annotate when we took off and radio back to Hanoi that. Uh, when we took off, and Hanoi, I guess, would tell the troops, you know, in the field, hunker down, you know, they're going to be there in six hours or eight hours or whatever it is. And uh, we knew they were there. They knew that we knew that we were there. It was kind of like a standoff. We really did too much. And I, I don't know if I, I uh, may get into, well, never mind. <laughs> We were coming back from one one of our missions, and like I told you, my pilot was a, a real, he was a fun-loving guy, would do anything for a laugh or to have fun, but he was serious as all get out when he was a pilot, okay? So about two hours out, he says, uh, let's have some fun today. So he radios back to Tower and says, uh, hey, we got a, a hung bomb in the bomb bay, and there's a procedure that you get down below 10,000 feet, and you go through, pilots go through certain, certain uh, functions. Well, to make a long story short, we were actually going down low level, we acquisitioned this Russian trawler, and we about three miles out, we put the crosshairs on the Russian trawler, and I guess the pilots had opened up the radio so that they knew what we were trying to do. <laughs> and so they see this big plane coming at them, and about three miles out, we open up the bomb <laughs> It's like six in the morning. And we roared over them. There's about six of them in the, in the drink. <laughs> and the gunner says, pilot, he says, uh, there's about six of them in the water. And he says, they're, they're a real friendly bunch, and they're waving to us, but only with one finger. <laughs> so, yeah. To my knowledge, our pilot never got into trouble for that, wow. uh, which kind of surprised me. I thought we'd hear all kinds of yeah. <laughs> well, I thought my guy would too, but apparently he didn't. The commander of the blue yeah. yeah. all so, the hangers. And maybe they just kind of looked the other way knowing, uh, you know, we uh, uh, let's go through hell. Yeah. With all I think they expect pilots to be a little crazy. Yeah, that's yeah. right. <laughs> you wouldn't be a pilot if you weren't a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's it. For us. Admiral, the Navy had control and didn't believe in that. Yeah, well, he didn't believe in Congress.